The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul of the soul and the spirit of the joints of the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, uh, Romans 3, verse 21, page 15 of your notes. It is our custom at Maranatha Church, and it always has been, to give believers an opportunity to make sure that uh, they start off on the right foot, so to speak, with regard to the intake of the Word of God. One, you have to be in fellowship. Two, you have to be teachable. You have to be open to the presentation of any information at any given time that is communicated to you in this environment. So let's take the usual time to make the usual and essential preparation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And we thank you that our faith in Jesus Christ has overcome the doom of the cosmos. We thank you for the hope of the gospel that we retain within ourselves and ask that you bless our appreciation of this presentation of the nature of our so great salvation in Christ's name. I want to touch on one thing on the preceding couple verses here before we move on into the section we got into Sunday. Now we know, we know our informed believers, obviously, that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under law. Under the law. So that every mouth <coughs> may be closed. That's a subjunctive. That particular verb is an aorist passive subjunctive. The mood of potentiality. Because every mouth is not going to be overthrown. It's only those who remain in a state of unbelief, their mouths will be closed. Okay? And all the world may become accountable to God. Now that's an indicative. Become accountable. It's an aorist indicative of genomai with the hapox hupodikos, accountable. All mankind will be accountable. Held accountable, uh, obviously, at, 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 uh, the, a difference between unbelievers and believers, but all will be held accountable for their actions and their approach to God and his plan during their time on earth. But every mouth being closed applies to those who are, uh, that every mouth may be closed, will apply to those who are on the wrong side of the issue at hand. Because by the works of the law, and the law, of course, here, by the works of the law, uh, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Salvation, therefore, is not through the works of any law system of morality or any system like the Israelite one that included elaborate rituals at the, head of, at the top of which was circumcision. Those are the works of the law. Those are activities people engage, engaged in. And these works cannot justify a person. If you understand that justification is the imputation or the crediting of plus R to the one who believes in Jesus Christ. You cannot gain the favor of God or salvation through good works as a non-believer. Only as a believer can you gain the favor of God through good works. But before the fact, works are off the table. <coughs> There's not enough works anyone could possibly do to offset the minus R factor. The minus R factor, which means personal sins, the minus R factor is always there. 
It is the barrier between having a relationship with God who is plus R. The only way that that can be altered is to change the plus R, the minus R factor into the plus R factor. And that happens when an individual believes in Jesus Christ, God credits to their account or imputes to them, however you want to express it, plus R, absolute righteousness. It is essential in this whole discussion to understand that to have an eternal relationship with God, the individual has to be in possession of the same righteousness that God inherently has within his essence. And the only way to get that is faith in the designated object. And then that is a part of the salvation package and that opens and that comes to us first logically. Have an eternal relationship with God, you must be plus R. In, uh, and, that, and that comes only through faith and never any works whatsoever. They cannot accomplish that. Good deeds cannot overcome the minus R factor. Okay. So, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. No exceptions. Nowhere. Nobody. At any time. <clears throat> The world exists with a lot of beliefs, those who believe or espouse an afterlife, something beyond here. Uh, the uh, humanity is, widely believes that if maybe you do enough good, maybe it's in a religion, maybe it's in whatever, that you can merit eternal life. You cannot, you cannot the best person that ever lived, whoever that is, humanly, has sinned. And that puts you behind that eight ball immediately and puts you in the same category as the rest of the human race, all are locked down in sin. <coughs> There's only one way out, and that's faith in the sin bearer, Jesus Christ. That gives you plus R and eternal life from that moment in your life forever. You're, you're fully qualified to uh, enter into the blessedness of phase three. The plan of God is divided into three phases. Phase one is salvation. It's a one-step process. There's no merit in the one believing. What we give God, if you want to put it that way, is we give him faith in Christ he gives us eternal salvation. That's settled forever. Whatever you think of it, uh, however you don't appreciate it, you believed in Christ whenever. You can't say, so I can't remember the day I believed. Okay, fine. You know that you have believed. You're in. That's phase one. Phase two is the believer in time. If you were, if you were saved when you were 20 and you die when you're 80, that's your phase two, 60 years. Phase three is the believer in the afterlife and all that is involved therein. All right, to our verses and this uh, mind-boggling, will it ever end sentence. <laughs> this is just like, I don't know of another long, uh, one that's as, this long in the Bible. Uh, offhand, I, I didn't go around looking, trying to look. I don't have time for that. But this one definitely is in the running for first place for a long sentence. It starts in verse 21, and it goes through verse 26. It's one sentence in the Greek. No breaks, other than maybe commas and semicolons, but that's it. But let's read it again. Uh, the solution to the problem, these verses I entitled, The Manifestation of Attainable Righteousness. But now, apart from law, a righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Old Testament contains in both the strictly the Mosaic law part of it and the prophets. The prophets include the named prophets plus individuals who weren't a mainline prophet but who prophesied like David. This is witnessed by the law or in the law it is witnessed 
revealed uh, by the law and the prophets, even a righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. While it might sound redundant, it has to be put this way. For, for those who believe, for there is no distinction. Everybody, it's open to anybody. There's no distinction based on any variables in the human race that you might want to name. Race, culture, anything. There's no distinction. It's open to everybody. For all have sinned. This refers to personal sinning primarily, although it could be argued that it also refers to the imputation of Adam's original sin, but actively, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He could have said the righteousness of God, but he says the glory of God, and that part of the attribute of God, his righteousness, his glory is all of his attributes. But the one that is featured here is his attribute of absolute righteousness. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption of which is in Christ Jesus. All this piles up, builds up. We are redeemed from something. It's a gift. It's a grace gift. It is without strings, and it's based on grace, not on human achievement. Whom God displayed publicly, reference to Jesus Christ, the crucifixion of Christ, and what occurred in particular in regards to the events involved in his time on the cross, he was displayed publicly. It was a public event. Many, many people were at the foot of the cross observing this event from the, from the beginning of it to its conclusion. Eyewitnesses, we would say, a bunch of them, individuals who were at the cross. The only disciple that was at the cross and an observer, and he says so in his gospel, is John. Jesus' mother was there, Mary, and others, of course. Those that were sad because they didn't gap the doctrine Jesus taught about the necessity of the cross followed by his resurrection. They were downcast. They were bummed out. And that's what happens to people, by, the, by an aside. That's what happens to us when we are not on top of things doctrinally. We're downcast, depressed, and all the rest of it. It does not glorify God. Period. Whatever excuses people want to make. And then, of course, all those that were out there that were mocking him while he was on the cross and happy to see it because they're beyond stupid, stupid. They didn't. I, I wonder if there was one person that publicly observed that, it had to be a believer, that was on top of the, on top of the game doctrinally. It wasn't John. It certainly wasn't Mary. Mary was miserable. And that blows my mind too a little bit. <laughs> it really does. Think of her history. From making her decision to go along with God's plan based on the announcement of the angel, did she, was she willing to uh, bear in her humanity, become pregnant, supernaturally, and bring the Messiah into the world. She signed off on it. It wasn't forced on her. Volition. And then all she said, and all those years with Jesus, and then his public ministry of healing and all these other miracles that he did. And then, of course, the thing that, that, that keeps your head, keeps you afloat, is what he said the end game was going to be. And the end game wasn't all bad. None of it was bad. 
Well, well, what was bad was, was people who mistreated him. Now that was bad. But he already prayed that they'd be forgiven of that and given a second chance. He did that from the cross. Can you imagine people doing that to you and you praying for them? Doing it at that level, I mean. One of his earliest sayings from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Because he's got his mind on the plan of God, and that's for, uh, for some, a lot of these, some of these people who were there as non-believers would later become believers. I don't know if his uh, half-brothers and family were there. They weren't even believers yet. It's to give everybody another chance. Divine forbearance. Give them another chance. Figure this out. Whom God, and I'll explain this in the analysis. And, 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 and don't let these big words scare you. Whom God publicly displayed as a propitiation, that is like a synonym for satisfaction. In his blood, we've got to explain that too. <coughs> through faith. He keeps coming back to faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. <clears throat> How could you save someone in the Old Testament before Christ appeared and died for, and bore the sins of the world? How could you save them if their sins had not already been judged and forgive them and give them the salvation? And, Pute to them righteousness, give them the salvation package, and then when they died, put them in a good place. How could you do that? Since technically, the basis for giving us plus R, there's another thing that has to be overcome, and that our sins have to be judged. And all human sins were judged in the humanity of Christ during the three hours of darkness. For a demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, post-crucifixion, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All right. This is quite a section. We saw that, but now, in verse 21, expresses a contrast between two periods of time. The now is the manifestation of justification by faith guaranteed by the appearing of Jesus Christ with special emphasis on his work towards sin on the cross. Has been manifested, refers to the coming of Christ, point three, and his sufferings for the sins of humanity. The words apart from the law draws our attention to a righteousness that is available to mankind that is attainable. And it is essential and necessary if, you, if, if an individual is to have a happy eternity. <laughs> there is an extreme contrast between justification through law, which is unattainable, which a lot of people historically have caught themselves up in, trying to be saved by, by human merit, trying to, trying to gain eternal salvation through human merit. There are religions that people are trying for their entire lifetime, this is what they try to do, and then they die and go to hell. All works-based systems whether they're religious or whatever they are. I'm just a good person. I do good things for people, blah, blah, blah. All right, fine. That will not get you anywhere in this particular game. You will not make it there doing this. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, that which is apart from law. We're looking at the righteousness which is available to the human race apart from law which I can't, I don't know everybody here perfectly, but for the majority of you, you all have this righteousness. You got it back when you believed in Christ. The contrast between the past and the present does not mean that this is attainable righteousness was now for the first time revealed or that in an earlier period men were justified by the works of the law. I say these things because there's dummies out there to believe this kind of stuff. Paul says that this is attainable righteousness. 
was this attainable righteousness was witnessed by the law and the prophets. This establishes harmony and continuity between the Old and New Testaments, the Mosaic law through the sacrificial code. What's, what about all those sacrifices? Animal sacrifices. You can go read about them in Leviticus 21. All these animal, all these different categories of animal sacrifices. Uh, they uh, place emphasis on the uh, the witness of this. I mean, and continuity uh, and and the and the prophets. So uh, and the prophets speak of a coming suffering Savior in a number of places. I just featured one that probably would be the one most recognizable to people, and that's the prophecy found in Isaiah 53 commonly referred to as the suffering servant. And it deals with more than just bearing sins. It deals with his life, it deals with his death, and it deals with after that, the glory that follows. When Paul says apart from the law or without law, he means this unequivocally. This means that in phase one justification, there is no contribution whatsoever by the works of the law. The righteousness of God, 14, that is manifested is that which was first noted in 117. The righteousness of God in verse 22 is same as that in 21 and 117. The words through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe has the same force as from faith to faith in 117. In presenting Jesus Christ as the object of faith, Paul for the first time brings to the forefront that which has not been expressly stated thus far in this letter. So it is 18, Jesus Christ, who is the object of justifying faith which is the righteousness that qualifies the individual for eternal salvation. 19, furthermore, the righteousness that comes via faith is effective whoever the individual is who believes, for all who believe. So you check yourself and say, oh, I'm one of those that believe. I believed in Jesus Christ. Congratulations. <laughs> Having demonstrated that both Jews and Gentiles are under sin and therefore all equally subject to condemnation. The glory of God's plan of salvation is that there is no distinction based on any variable among humans. 22, all are, in, all are in need, equally in need of justifying faith, and all who exercise saving faith are granted justification. Justification is just another term for salvation, but it, 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 it emphasizes a certain aspect of salvation. Or redemption emphasizes another, or regeneration emphasizes another aspect of salvation. These are the terms under the general doctrine of salvation. Justification, regeneration, redemption, and so forth. For all of sin indicates that all have violated the moral code exemplified in the Ten Commandments, whatever differences exist in aggravation, all are sinners. 24, the phrase, and fall short of the glory of God, refers to his perfect righteousness. 25, only Jesus Christ was without sin. He was born without a sin nature, hence the virgin birth, and maintained a perfect life as a human from a small child to an adolescent to an adult male all the way to the end. He never sinned once. He was tempted but he never succumbed on even one occasion. Mind-boggling. That's mind-boggling, really. I mean, we commit sins of ignorance, humans. I didn't know that was a sin. You came to Bible class, you found out it was a sin. Maybe it was a sin of the tongue. Speech. Complaining. Do you need complaining today? Don't raise your hand. Complain about anything? Minor, major, whatever, that's a sin. We're not supposed to do that. So you catch yourself and rebound. He never had to, he never had to rebound. He knew who he was, too. I don't know at what age he became aware of this fact. I do know that his humanity grew in wisdom, just as his body grew in stature. From a baby in his mother's arms to an adult male, He knew who he was. He knew he was the Messiah. He figured this out, and it came to him through his own study and whatever exposure he had. I don't know what his mother and his father, natural, his, his legal father, had to, told him in this regard. But one day, he became aware that he was the Messiah. Somebody had to. And he also realized, guess what else? 
He was God, the God man, son of God, capital letters. And one of his big temptations through his ministry was he was not allowed to tap into his deity to alleviate hunger, tiredness, or anything else. Yet, with his deity, he could tap into it and feed 5,000 people on one occasion. Out of one basket. <laughs> because as the disciples who were, who were the waiters were distributing the food, I bet they were busy. And these people were really hungry, too. And they're running back and forth. Of course, they're young guys. They can do that. They're running back and forth carrying the bread and the fish out of one basket. In his deity, he created food out of nothing. And it wasn't to benefit him. It was to benefit the multitude. You study the miracles of Jesus, and then all the people that witnessed that. Guess what happened to us today? We got a free meal created by his, by his, by his work there. <clears throat> The only time he ever, that I have any awareness of, that he tapped into his deity for his own personal benefit is when it came time for him to physically die. He used his deity to pull his soul and his spirit out of his body, and he died, and his ministry ended. Because he told his disciples up front, but people aren't listening. No man takes my life. I lay down my life. Well, it sure looks like they're taking your life on the cross, but technically they didn't take his life. He took it. His deity checked out his humanity. Deity can't die or suffer in any way. But humanity can. And then he was involved in, three days later, raising his humanity up and having a resurrection body. That's our Savior. Get to know him. Because he's seated at the right hand of God and he's coming back to this earth real soon. And it isn't to die for sins and suffer. It's to set up his Father's kingdom. And the only ones that can participate in it at the beginning at least are those who are his children from all the ages. You'll be there in a resurrection body because you've been justified by faith. Uh, so verse 24 resumes the subject of 22a. In verse 24, Paul asserts the fact that justification is totally unmerited. It is a gift. You know what a gift is, don't you? The right kind of gift? To an undeserving person, maybe? And is based on God's grace. Salvation via the gospel is a gift of free grace. Man cannot add anything to it. 32, the emphasis on free grace came at a price. That is, through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. The price paid magnifies the free gift offered to all who believe in the designated object of salvation. The root meaning of redemption is to ransom by the payment of a price. 35, our redemption from the slave market of sin, I use that terminology because it's, it's, I think it's helpful, is said to be in Christ Jesus which is positional sanctification. In the church age, all believers are entering into union with Jesus Christ. That's positional sanctification. You are in Christ. You're still in the world. You're still in Oklahoma City or wherever. You're still in down here. But you are in Christ, which is positional sanctification. It is described in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. That places emphasis on eternal life. One sip of this water, you got eternal life. Regular water, you have to keep coming back to it. <laughs> and also Romans 6, 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? I'm not going to explain all that right now. In Galatians 3, 27. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. 
I'm not explaining all that yet either. I just wanted to cite those verses to show that, uh, that, that the phrase here, uh, in Christ Jesus, is positional sanctification. That's another aspect of salvation. And all that this implies by being in this simple diagram, this is a, this is a, this is a dry baptism entered into union with Christ. This is posi you are positionally in this realm, in Christ. Therefore, that means a number of things. You share who and what he is, but you can't be deity, but you share his royalty. Your royal family, he's royalty. <coughs> and you share his destiny. And no one can remove you from union with Christ. Death, anything. No, any, anything bad. And there's plenty of bad stuff out here that could, that could separate you from your life. But that's all in God's hands, too, if you believe those things. In verse 25a, Paul cites the basis for our justification and redemption. Christ work on the cross to remove the sin barrier. Okay, let's look at that. Uh, this was displayed publicly. Aorist, middle, indicative. Pro, tithemi. Uh, in Romans 1.13, it means to plan something and in Ephesians 1.19. But here in the middle voice, it should be understood as to set forth publicly. And this usage is frequently found in the papyra. That's remnants of writings that have come preserved and have come down to us from the time of the Koine Greek of the Bible. That this was, this was used in that kind of a context. And this usage is frequently found in papyra. Uh, so to set forth publicly before, before eyewitnesses, Acts 26, 26. Uh, read that real quick. You can find it. Uh, Paul is defending himself, and a charge is brought against him before a Roman official called Festus. Festus hears all this, Paul. You'd have to read the whole thing. So Festus, in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. <laughs> but Paul said, I'm not out of my mind. Most excellent Festus, see, shows respect for a government authority. But, but, I, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters. And I speak to him also with confidence. Since I'm persuaded that none of these things escape his notice, for this was not done in a corner. And of course, he, those, those officials were close enough to the event of, of the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, that they could check out all the salient details to satisfy their own mind, that this wasn't some big hoax. It's right there in front of them, evidence. This is, this, is what, this is what God supplies us with on a number of topics. And you should not shove it aside with some big mouth statement about you've lost your mind. That doesn't, that doesn't knock out the evidence that's out there. God has supplied us for evidence for the things communicated, even to this day. One way, archaeology. Supporting evidence that the names and places in the Bible can be verified extra-biblically. These men and these people mentioned and these places and everything. Just take the book of Acts, for example. There was a guy, I forgot his name, he was an Englishman. He was a learned guy. <sighs> forgot his name. I said. But you know what he did? He wasn't a believer. But to his credit, you know what he did? He had the wherewithal to do this. This is way back in the day before automobiles and airplanes, okay? Way back. No, I mean way, way back. 
he retraced the footsteps of these places here in the Bible. You know what he came out of it with? The integrity of the historical record of Acts, and he became a believer. And he wrote a book. And I'm sorry I forgot his name. Now that's a lot of work to go travel to the Middle East, go travel to those areas and, and move around and look all this stuff up. He already, ha already had a classical education. He's one of the exceptions in the world to someone with that kind of smarts and that kind of bringing up that he would actually go to this trouble. You know, it was, for him, I don't know if it was expensive, but it certainly was time consuming. And you're moving to a lot of places and looking at a lot of stuff. And that's his testimony. And, you know, this can be verified in a lot of ways that the Bible is the word of God. This isn't just some, if, if, if people patched this whole thing together, it'd be the biggest joke around. It'd be a hodgepodge of contradictions and inaccuracies and who's that and all the rest of it. Now, if there's things in the Bible we still haven't figured out, uh, it's just because we haven't come up with it, but everything around it. There used to be a day when they made fun of stuff in the Old Testament, but they got, uh, archaeologists got over there and they started discovering that these people really existed. There was a Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> And all these other people. So God has left witness on the earth of the integrity of the Bible. You read the other holy writings, they're a complete, utter joke. They're made up. The Bible wasn't made up. Men moved by the Spirit. Pinned down exactly what God wanted them to. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. Okay. Moving on. And uh, so this was publicly displayed. 38, God publicly displayed his son. As I, as I read that verse in Acts 26, 20, this, to the, to, the Roman, to, 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 the, to the officials that he was brought before and on trial, he said, sir, this stuff wasn't done in a corner. This didn't happen out here in, out here in the Thule's somewhere, in the backwaters. This was done publicly in Jerusalem where there was people there. At, they'd come from all around for Passover. Oh, it's just another Passover. We're, tra we're Jews. We're traveling, to, we're traveling to the Holy Land and we're going we're gonna to do Passover in the land of, of promise. Whoa, guess what you just stepped into? You stepped into 33 A.D., You got more and you bargained for, way more. Publicly displayed. God publicly displayed his son, a propitiation, which is an atoning sacrifice, one that is satisfactory. Satisfactory in what regards? That it completely satisfies God's righteousness, holiness, if you will, that sins have gone to court and been paid for. I can use a simple analogy. One human could pay for another's infraction. Ah, I got a speeding ticket. I ran a red light. I'll pay it for you. You did the thing, but I pay it for you. Okay? I'll take care of it. So the noun, hilasterion, occurs only here and in Hebrews 9, 5, where it is translated mercy seat. <clears throat> now the mercy seat was a lid, rectangular gold, solid gold lid that sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant in the most holy place with two angelic uh, beings in gold looking down where they almost touch. And here's the mercy seat. The rectangular box underneath it <clears throat> was made of wood overlaid with gold. And inside it were three items. The, ori the original Ten Commandments. Well, not maybe the original original, but the second set. Close enough. <clears throat> and a gold urn with 
some of the original manna that fell out of heaven. Well, that would be so dried up, it wouldn't be funny, wouldn't it? I mean, it would just be gone. No, it was supernaturally preserved. And we're talking about the uh, Moses' day and down through. And then there was Aaron's rod, his, his walking staff. Because his, his position was challenged by people. He threw it, it was thrown on the ground and it sprouted almond buds. What? It's, dead, it's a dead piece of wood. I got some dead things over here that the, that the, that the cold, I think, has pretty well done in. There's nothing I can do to bring them to life. It's just a dead plant. Now, on top of that, once a year, the pie priest would go in there in his full dress uniform and apply blood to the mercy seat. The holy place, most holy place, represents the third heaven. And it's a symbol of atonement. Taking the blood of an animal and sprinkling it on top of that gold lid. The box itself, the lid, represents Christ. How so? Christ was in humanity, true humanity. <clears throat> That's your wood. And what you think the gold represents. The two are put together by the technique of an artisan that can overlay wood with, overlay wood with gold. Gold is his deity. Moving on. <clears throat> God's perfect righteousness was propitiated. As all sins of all time and all people past, present, and future from that moment, ones that had never been committed yet, like ours. All sins were judged in the body of Christ. He was made a pincushion. This started at around 12 noon on that day. He went on the cross, he went on the cross around 9 in the morning, or, or 9 in the morning. <clears throat> And three hours later, when the sun strayed overhead, high noon, everything went dark. Boom, dark. I mean, boom. I mean the kind of dark that you couldn't see a candle in front of your face. But they had flashlights back then. <laughs> you could feel it. People have told me how places on earth that are dark, like the Merrimack Caverns in Missouri, go way down into one of those. You want to see dark for the first time. I haven't been there. I haven't gone to that. I haven't taken that trip. I'll take their word for it. Now, this is where I've got in trouble with certain people. In his blood refers to what transfer, transpired during the three hours of darkness when Jesus' humanity, get this, was under the wrath of God. He's under a curse. The, the, the whole thing's pictured in the desert with, this, with the bronze serpent. Bronze is a symbol of judgment and a serpent, well, you know what it is a symbol of, and the serpent is lifted up. He who knew no sin I'll give you in another way it's in the Bible. He who knew no sin, not ex he knew what sin was. He didn't know it experientially. If you never experienced a particular thing, you can just only know what others say about it until you personally experience it. He never personally experienced what it's like to have a mental attitude sin. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, made sin. The innocent, that's the whole picture of animal sacrifices. A cute little innocent lamb has its little throat cut and it dies, or whatever other animal you're talking about. The innocent substituted for the guilty. And the innocent suffers for the guilty. 
so the guilty can go free. That's that simple. <clears throat> now, let me, let's talk about blood. Jesus was a normal human being in the sense that the only difference between Jesus, well, differences uh, one, from general humanity is he was born without a sin nature. He did not have that in his genetic code. That was very important. And he managed to live all those years and never commit one personal sin. He was tempted. The devil tempted him right at the beginning of his ministry. And his biggest temptation wasn't the one de the devil put on him during the 40 days in the wilderness. The biggest temptation he had was in Gethsemane Garden to go to the cross and endure this aspect of it. Many believers have been martyred and had a good attitude. I've been told. So-and-so's book of martyrs. They didn't go in there, oh, 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 and all they're falling apart and carrying on. That doesn't glorify God. Believers have been tortured. They've been murdered, martyred. And they did it with a good attitude. It's their time to go. This is, I'm going to seal my face too with, a, with, this, with this application. <clears throat> the thing he dreaded wasn't what the Romans did to him. Before the cross, during the cross, and all the rest of it. That's not what the temptation in Gethsemane that caused him to go to his knees three times and to, to exude actual blood through his pores. It's a medical condition. It's a rare one. Being under such stress that blood popped out of his skin. Uh, right through his skin, a little bit weeped out. I one, one of the authors, I forget which one, m makes mention of that. And I, I have a book that describes what that is medically. It's rare, but it does occur. That's the first bloody, that blood coming to the outside of his body. Okay? Stick with me. <coughs> His blood does not refer to the blood that Jesus shed before, during, and I could have said during, and after his time on the cross. All references to the atoning blood of Christ constitute a, get it, you can underline it, representative analogy, not a direct analogy. The springboard is animal sacrifices. They shed, the way they died was they shed blood. People and animals can die by bleeding to death. Okay. So if it was the literal blood of Christ, he should have bled to death, right? To have a direct analogy. Animal bleeds to death, Jesus bled to death. The problem is, he didn't bleed to death. His cause of physical death had nothing to do with the blood that he lost before, on, etc., Nothing. So his blood, the blood of a lamb, he's called a lamb too, he's obviously not a four-footed creature, lamb of God. That'll be his name featured in the tribulation under the hide us from the wrath of the lamb. That's almost funny, not, you know, but I mean, because he's going he's gonna to be called the lamb, the wrath of the lamb. Lambs, we never associate wrath and any danger from a lamb. I never heard anything. Now, yeah, a male, a male ram, that, there, there can be some danger there. Just don't bend over uh, and turn away from them. You may get plowed into the rear end. It happened to my mom out on the ranch. <laughs> Boom! She was not happy. <laughs> Sacrificial animals all died by bleeding to death. Jesus not only did not bleed to death, he never lost consciousness through loss of blood, a medical condition. And he had plenty of blood in his body after he died physically. This Roman soldier told, showed us that one. He fulfilled prophecy. Now, he wasn't trying to be mean. He had a job to do. Because of the unusual circumstances under which Christ died versus the other two fellows on the cross, 
He had to make sure he was dead, and thank God he did. He ran a spear in, under Jesus' rib cage, right up on the side where his heart was, and guess what came out? Blood, it says in the Bible, blood and water, blood and serum. When a person dies, their blood starts separating. Perfect medically, perfect. And he was already dead physically. Everybody watched him die physically. They watched him make his final statement from the cross. Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he breathed his last. Because when you breathe your first, that's when you got your soul as a little infant out of your mother's womb. Your first breath of air is when you got your soul. And if you do your last one, that's when your soul leaves your body. It says in the Old Testament, so-and-so breathed his last and died and went to his fathers. It's referred to as believers. All right, we'll pick this up tomorrow night. Be here. Huh? What? Did I miss something? No, there's not much left. There's not much left. Well, I can stretch three points into two days. <laughs> That's not funny with some people, but that's the way it is. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>